So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to come and talk to you. I, I appreciate it, uh, learning a lot more about the technology infrastructure that NBCR is developing and collaborating with uh, a number of partners and the deep scientific domain connections that this group has. And uh, so as, as Wolford mentioned, I'm at uh, RENCI, and we are an applied research group uh, partnered with, uh, as part of UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, but we also work extensively with Duke University and NC State. We have offices out there. And one of our responsibilities is to bring sort of a, a multi-institutional, uh, multi-domain capability, sort of a neutral ground, if you will, that uh, is a great place for uh, researchers from across these different campuses to, to work together. So typically when I give this talk, I start off with uh, the idea that computational science is a critical component of discovery, but I don't need to mention that to this crowd because you, you guys are all on board with that. Uh, but this is sort of the underlying philosophy uh, throughout this talk, that uh, computational science is increasingly important for scientific discovery. So first to do a little bit of level setting uh, before we get into it, I'd like to talk about uh, so these two different computing paradigms, uh, high performance computing and high throughput computing. And there's some similarities and some differences, and there are advantages to one and disadvantages to the other. There are certain applications that will only function in one of these versus the other, uh, but that's not always the case. So for high performance uh, computing, uh, we're typically talking about tightly coupled parallel applications, uh, all of the MD codes, anything that's that's using MPI for interprocess communication, high interprocess communication. And uh, there are a lot of uh, well-known applications that do scale well. So many of the MD applications that you use uh, and some of them that are developed right here uh, with this team are examples of those. Uh, in addition to that, you've got sort of your top end computational scientists in the world in this space. You know, what does it take to effectively scale up to 20,000, 30,000 cores uh, on a particular individual simulation. Uh, there's, a, there's a fairly small number of people throughout the world that are, that are really capable of doing that type of work. So some of the characteristics that you find in this high performance computing world is that not only are the processes tightly coupled, but most commonly uh, the user is tightly coupled to the resource. You're going to SSH into a login node, a head node, and typically issue Q sub commands. You have uh, a lot of knowledge about the specific resource, about the, uh, the particular type of interconnect, uh, where, libraries are in, where libraries are installed, where paths are, where the, where the software is within the system. Oftentimes, you've got a very deep knowledge of uh, the particular system that you're operating on. And so a question comes about, how does distributed or grid computing fit uh, within large-scale HPC applications? Uh, one thing that we know uh, for certain is that uh, highly Tightly coupled interprocess communication across the WAN is just not feasible. It's not appropriate. We just don't do it. Um, but there are cases where you may want to use distributed computing just to launch your jobs or to access your jobs. But if you're running a very large simulation with very many way parallel, you're probably not even doing that. You're probably logging in and, and interacting with the system directly. High throughput computing is, uh, is a little different in that um, it's primarily geared towards serial jobs, uh, Monte Carlo simulations, pr parameter sweeps, uh, pleasantly parallel. It looks like it got chopped off, as I like to call it. I find nothing embarrassing about being highly parallel. There's, there's nothing embarrassing at all about that. <laughs> it's pleasantly parallel. Um, so in this scenario, uh, to, to effectively do high throughput computing, um, there's, a, there's a very fundamental difference, and that is that the user is decoupled from the resource. So if, yes, if you're using a, a, you know, your desktop or a cluster, uh, but to do truly global scale, uh, high throughput computing, where you've got 100,000, 2 million jobs, each of which are going to run for anywhere from 2 to 10 hours, you need to be able to characterize that work, dump it onto a system, and not care where it runs. You know, is it going to run on my desktop? Is it going to backfill uh, idle cycles in a research, in a, in a compute cluster, in a research computing at some university that you have no affiliation with? Uh, where is that job going to run? You don't know, and you don't care. And it's a very important concept in, in high throughput computing. Now, in this case, you're not going to have SSH access. You're not able to log into these systems and probe them. You're not able to log in and poke around and see what's out there. So it's a different mode of working. Uh, and it can be a little more frustrating if you're used to logging into systems. Uh, but with the right infrastructure and framework and experience, uh, it can work extremely well. 
The other thing about high throughput computing is you're typically engaged with a much larger community. So you need to know what the rules of the road are and you need to be able to play well with others. Um, and there's some, there's some ways in which uh, that's sort of enforced through social dynamics. And finally, that there really are uh, remarkable scaling opportunities in high throughput computing, and we'll talk about some of those examples. So finally, with that introduction, just a quick uh, view of the agenda, what I'm going to talk about. I'd like to give a little bit of background on the Terra grid, uh, the open science grid, and wrap that up with a comment on uh, the national cyber infrastructure, uh, if such things sh should exist. And then uh, finally move into uh, how uh, we at RENSI help scientists take advantage of these resources. So the infrastructure that we have, the services that we have, the methodology that we use to help bridge scientists into these very large scale uh, computing. Because it gets highly complex very quickly. And anybody who spent a lot of time uh, doing this kind of work understands and would probably prefer to be doing their domain scientist instead of becoming a computer scientist or a system administrator. And that's our goal. How many people are familiar with the Terra grid and the open science grid? Okay, so that gives me a, a very good idea of how much I should and should not talk about them, so I'll go through them pretty quickly. So the TerraGrid, uh, this is the uh, National Science Foundation Office of Cyber Infrastructure major play for uh, computational and cyber infrastructure for research and education. Uh, there's an uh, incredible array of resources out there from computation to visualization resources, uh, storage, um, SDSC, a prominent player in this and a very talented uh, set of staff and support infrastructure to help make this happen. So as we see here, um, the key thing, one of the things I like to point out is that uh, these are available to the research community at no cost, but you do compete for it, much like you compete for funding awards, and through a peer review process, you need to acquire an allocation uh, to get access uh, to these resources. And there are many different ways in which you can uh, get into these resources, whether you're uh, logging in and submitting directly to uh, the batch scheduler or using some more of the grid interfaces. If you have a program that you've developed or that uh, a group like NBCR has developed that has the ability to interact with some of these uh, distributed computing interfaces, then you can run these systems and submit jobs without having to log in. Uh, but it's still fairly non-trivial. Uh, so here we see a, a listing of some of these systems. Uh, if, Many of you probably have accounts on some of these, uh, over 60,000 cores uh, down in Texas, uh, some large shared memory machines, uh, very fast interconnects on some of these, uh, Condor Pool for some of that high throughput, loosely coupled type systems out there at, uh, at Purdue University, 22,000 CPUs in that pool, and uh, some gateway hosting capabilities, which we'll talk about in a minute, visualization and storage. So a very large smattering of resources across a number of dis different institutions. And although there are some uh, interfaces which allow you to, to look at uh, all of these different components holistically, for the most part, uh, for an individual researcher to interact with these systems without the use of a gateway or some other type of uh, IT or technology support infrastructure, uh, for the most part, you're interacting with these things individually. And it can be uh, very cumbersome to begin to know all of the details of each of these individual systems and how to, how to best take advantage of them. So that's one of the reasons that uh, the TerraGrade Science Gateways program uh, was developed to uh, begin to provide higher level services on top of that very complex, deep and broad fabric, computational cyber infrastructure fabric that's underneath. And today there are about 35 different science gateways. Uh, in fact, uh, NBCR is one of them in, the, in terms of the OPAL services being able to uh, submit jobs out into TerraGrid resources. There, that makes it a TerraGrid Science Gateway. And uh, the RENC Science Portal as well, which I'll talk more about. So shifting gears in the Open Science Grid, uh, I saw fewer hands raised uh, when, when I asked about the science, Open Science Grid, OSG. Um, OSG was created uh, as the U.S. contribution to the worldwide compute data processing engine for the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, the big instrument in, in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, for the high energy physics community in particular. So uh, this project has been going on with uh, different names, different funding streams for about 10 years in preparation for the LHC turn on, which uh, should probably be later this calendar year. And uh, that instrument uh, is the kind of instrument where you get one per planet, 
not one per lab. At $10 billion in 10 years, uh, that's not something that everybody's going to have. So the entire high energy physics community has done a very good job of coming together and, and creating this worldwide federation uh, in terms of the uh, community and the technology infrastructure to share the data that comes off of that instrument, to distribute it around the globe, and to compute on that data in a global fashion. So the best way to think of the open science grid is as a framework for large-scale distributed resource sharing. The OSG as an entity does not own a single CPU, not a single core, not a single system. It's a federation of other entities that have agreed to come together and to work together in a community to find ways that will allow, you, allow these uh, individuals and labs to share resources. If you had a thousand node cluster in your lab, uh, you know, chances are there are going to be times when you're not using that whole system. And there's going to be other times, maybe a week before a paper deadline, where you need orders of magnitude more than those thousand cores. It's the way of life. Uh, our computational requirements are very spiky. You go on vacation, you start teaching a semester, um, and you're not using your systems. But at other times, uh, you need much more than you might be able to get for your own individual lab. So what would it take to convince you to join a broader community where some people uh, will be coming in and using resources uh, that, that are unused by you? So it knows how to uh, scale back when you are not using it, and it knows how to keep the pressure on your system when you're not using it. Uh, what are the issues that you would be thinking about uh, when somebody approaches you to try and convince you to join such a community? And that's what this group has been doing for the last 10 years. And so there's over 80 sites across the United States that are participating in this distributed resource sharing framework. And uh, they, this uh, system processes on the order of a half a million uh, compute jobs per day across these different 80 sites. And when you see about uh, the numbers about what OSG is processing and what different people are, are uh, computing on OSG, uh, that's, that's not the total set of resources available because when somebody contributes a cluster, you're typically only pre presenting a portion of that cluster because you're, re you're reserving a lot of that use for yourself. So what OSG gets is a very small fraction of the, over -total, the total overall capabilities of the systems that are interconnect interconnected. But to give you a sense of the scale, uh, this is a chart I pulled off the reporting system uh, just a few hours ago. And what this is showing us is the uh, monthly CPU hours per VO. VO is a, is a group of like-minded individuals. You can imagine uh, if NBCR were to get involved in, in OSG, NBCR would be a VO or a virtual organization within OSG, for example. So uh, generally speaking, it's been scaling up a little bit and peaking around 16 million CPU hours per month. Uh, so that just gives you a sense of the size of, of the OS open science grid. And even though it was created originally by the high-energy physicists, for the high-energy physicists, uh, NSF, Office of Cyber Infrastructure, has taken note of this system and uh, has funded uh, my team in particular to help bring non-high-energy physicists onto this system. It doesn't work for everybody. It's not a good infrastructure for doing MD calculations. But if you needed to do a very large Monte Carlo sweep as a preparation for your large MD calculation, this would be a fantastic tool. So over the years, we've been uh, getting a lot of other science domains. We do a lot of biochemistry, bioinformatics, genetics, and metagenomics in particular, and also some interesting work with text mining. So the Open Science Grid is available and open to everybody uh, to come in and join. There's no allocations process. Uh, you don't have to submit a proposal uh, to get CPU hours, um, but uh, there's no guarantee either, right? So it's, a, it's an opportunistic usage uh, environment. And uh, we found uh, that uh, you know, bringing on a new user, we've, we've had users, uh, some users be very successful in pulling down on the order of 30 to 50,000 CPU hours per day, basically just by skimming off the unused cycles from these very large physics experiments. That's pretty impressive. So you are a scientist, and you are doing computation as part of your work. And where do you go for services? Well. You, as a PI, may own and operate a cluster that was awarded to you by NSF. Uh, or you may have uh, cobbled together some funds and participated in a campus-wide uh, condominium computing type environment where 
you buy three or four or five blades and a blade chassis and those are dedicated to you and much like the open science grid uh, uh, a lot of these campus-wide condominium computing environments are doing that resource sharing where if you're not using your cycles that gets contributed back out to the campus and if you are using them nobody else gets them that, that sort of work you may have a departmental cluster uh, there may, there's a campus research computing group uh, both here at UCSD, there's SDSC, and I think Scripps has a campus research computing group. You may have a campus-wide condo pool. Many universities are starting to stand those up where they are tying together uh, machines from the computer labs and the coffee shops and the administrative departments for the high-throughput computing. It doesn't work for HPC. There are also regional grids like the Northwest Indiana Computational Grid tying together Purdue, Indiana University, and a number of other uh, universities in that area where you've got a region-wide grid. Uh, communities of practice, NanoHub, GridChem, uh, NBCR, where you uh, have a, uh, a group like this. There are NIH computational centers, the Open Science Grid, which we talked about, TerraGrid, uh, Department of Energy, Insight. When does it stop? Where does it stop? And of course, the commercial cloud providers. Lots of opportunities for you, right? Lots of confusion. <laughs> where do I go for services? And of course, the answer is you go wherever you can get it with the least amount of pain, right? That's what we all do, most, for the most part. But the question then becomes, how many different software interfaces are you dealing with across all of these different providers? How many different software stacks do you have to worry about? And policy frameworks, which can even sometimes be even more cumbersome than software stacks and service interfaces. And how many identities do you have? You know, within the campus, maybe you can get by with a single identity on your, on your, your own uh, lab cluster and the research computing department, but then when you get out to the TerraGrid and to uh, the NIH centers and, the TerraGrid and uh, to the DOE centers and the commercial cloud service providers, how many different identities are you going to have to maintain there? So these are the, some of the issues and some of the pains that, uh, that we have seen uh, w with scientists that, uh, that are getting frustrated and, and trying to do really very large computational simulations that, that stretch beyond the boundaries of any one of these. And then my question uh, to the NSF staffers in the room, whoever they may be, is uh, <laughs> where is the national cyber infrastructure in this, in this landscape, right? How do you think about this ecosystem in a sort of a holistic environment? So I, I refer back to uh, this cyber infrastructure vision document from, uh, from March of 2007. And uh, what they've said here underlined in green is that NSF will invest in leadership class really big honking machines, you know, right? uh, 0 0.5 to 10 petascale. That's your Ranger. That's your Blue Waters. There's going to be a couple of those systems placed around the United States. But then what I find with my work on the open science grid a little more interesting is that uh, they say NSF will also promote resource sharing between and among academic institutions to optimize the accessibility and use of HPC assets deployed and supported at the campus level. So this is the, uh, the campus bridging aspect. How do you begin to tie all of these amazing capabilities between the PI-owned clusters, the campus research computing centers, into the TerraGrid, into the Open Science Grid, into the NIH computational centers? How can we begin to tie all of those together? And uh, I believe that this statement here uh, shows that NSF is, is interested in that space and, is, and views that as an important step in their vision for cyber infrastructure. So I'd like to make a prediction, uh, and that is that high throughput computing concepts and infrastructure are going to begin to transform the high performance computing landscape in the coming years. And specifically, decoupling users from resources. Uh, as we get many core systems, individual nodes in a compute cluster that have 32, 64 cores, uh, as we get um, uh, more and more universities deploying research computing clusters and labs deploying these things. Imagine if you had access to tens of thousands of job slots where each job slot can run, say, for example, a 64-way parallel job. Now, now you're talking about high-throughput computing with uh, parallel applications. And it's not unlike cloud computing in the sense that what you're going to have is some form of API access to these resources. You know, the industry is all, you know, cloud, cloud computing, this new, fantastic, amazing thing. Uh, but in a lot of ways, it's, it's a natural outgrowth of, of what's been happening for a long time in the academic world with respect to uh, sort of a natural next step with respect to grids and distributed computing and high throughput computing, bringing it all together and taking it to the next step come on, come on, and then monetizing it. But, you know, the idea of, you know, ha having uh, such a large uh, 
bag of slots, potential job slots for, uh, maybe you can't do a thousand way job, but if you could partition your thousand way job up into a whole bunch of 64 way jobs, it might very well be worth the effort in terms of how fast it's going to be uh, to turn that around. So this is my, my personal rant for today. So on to the Renzi Science Portal. Uh, we call this thing, it's called the Science Portal, which is a misnomer. There is a portal associated with it, but uh, it's a very small function of, a um, very small part of the function. Uh, much like the MBCR infrastructure, you know, it has the portal, but a lot of the really important stuff is in the Opal services and some of the back-end guts and the web services interfaces. And in fact, there are quite a few similarities uh, between the Science Portal and, and the MBCR work, uh, which uh, Wilford and I are cont continuing to talk about. So the Science Portal is used by our engagement team as a toolbox to assist researchers with large-scale computational science problems. So we tried to build it and they will come for a while and it didn't work. So <laughs> we view the Science Portal as this toolbox that we use. Now it's possible, entirely possible, that somebody could come in and get an account in the portal and it does exactly what they want, in which case that's great. Uh, but that's not our focus. Our focus is to, uh, to get to know researchers, to understand what their problems are, what they're trying to solve, how they're working, and to understand how far into the IT computer science space they want to be and don't want to be. And then we take our science portal infrastructure and our human expertise and knowledge and experience and relationships with the cyber infrastructure communities and meet them at the appropriate point. That's what we call our engagement methodology. And, and, and it's one way you could think of it as just simple consulting, but I think it's an important distinction that we like to make in terms of how we work with, uh, with people who are using the science portal. So it's accessible via many different ways, uh, web services, web browser, and a couple of specific Java applications that we've developed. And in fact, uh, because the vision uh, a workflow framework can, can implement uh, standard web services. Uh, the Vision framework will directly interact with uh, these services as well. And we're going to be looking for some specific use cases to push on that. So as I mentioned, uh, we're actively seeking engagements with scientists, uh, specifically that can show uh, broad community-wide impact. Uh, this system is backed by very large computational capacity in that we can submit jobs out to the TerraGrid, out to the Open Science Grid, out to an NIH resource uh, called BASE, uh, which happens to be at UNC Chapel Hill. And uh, we also provide access through this infrastructure to some of the RENC specific resources as well. It's currently geared towards high throughput computing, uh, but as uh, my earlier uh, prediction uh, begins to evolve, I think that'll uh, in engage a lot more on the uh, parallel, parallel applications as well, specifically with ensembles and large suites, uh, large suites of uh, MPI runs. So here is uh, my fancy technical diagram. Uh, and having heard some of the questions in the audience throughout uh, today and yesterday, I know that uh, this will not scare anybody here because you've been dealing with stuff just as complicated or worse in the IT space. So this, uh, this part in white is basically the front end of the system. And here is the little portal system we had talked about with the, you know, with the web interface and the portlets and those sorts of things. And yes, you can submit jobs and launch jobs through the web interface. Uh, we find that that's maybe useful for training and teaching and exploratory work, but no real scientists are, are doing that, certainly not with our system. And uh, much like the uh, Opal Services, uh, to be able to maintain this infrastructure with a reasonable set of staff, um, we have a very similar concept in terms of wrapping up a command line application with metadata and then generating everything, generating the web service endpoints, asynchronous, synchronous, generating the portlets that come out of it, the documentation, everything that uh, can be uh, written up as metadata on application is, and then there's a generator that just makes all this stuff happen. So uh, on the front end, the most interesting parts are these uh, asynchronous web services and these applications that we've started to build as a result of our engagements with specific researchers uh, that leverage this whole, inf this whole infrastructure. And in particular, uh, I'd like to highlight the Blastmaster, which is relevant to this crowd. Uh, we, uh, and I'll show some charts on this, but we met up with the group at uh, the Stanford Genome Technology Center, and it's a pretty common story in metagenomics these days. They bought themselves a new high throughput sequencer, and now they can't process their data in a sufficient time before they get their next PIRA sequencing run. So uh, they had locally owned, a local PI-owned cluster, compute cluster, and that's the way they've been doing their work for years, uh, but now they're generating too much data to continue to operate that way. 
And in conversations with them, we decided that probably the easiest way to solve this problem would be to just simply wrap up a new application called Blastmaster, which enables them to take uh, 100,000 sequences, throw it into our system. And then we take care of submitting those jobs out wherever we, wherever we find is to be the most highly available at the time and sending the results back. So it's very easy to, to create this new Java uh, Swing desktop application that exercises our services that fits their usage model, which we believe is going to fit the same usage model for a lot of other labs as well. So that's the front end of the system. And then the vision workflow service would, will be able to come in through just like any other web service client. Uh, through either the asynchronous or the synchronous web services. But once the workload has been transferred to RENC, to our hosted infrastructure, we dump it into a Condor pool. Condor is a high throughput distributed computing infrastructure. It comes out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It's the backbone of the open science grid. And one of the primary reasons for using Condor is their matchmaking interface. So we uh, have this, this notion of late binding. So when we get a job, a compute job, everything is uh, characterized, everything that we need is characterized about that job in terms of what its requirements are. I need a 32-bit OS, a 64-bit OS. I have special requirements. I don't. I have to have this particular database. I need, I need, to, have, uh, I need to land in a place where there's blast. So we define everything, all the requirements that this job has, and, and embed that with the job submission. And then we just dump it into the Condor pool. And the Condor pool decides, where am I going to run this job? So and that's a, it's interesting. And this is uh, you know, one of the real benefits of high throughput computing, this, this late binding. So Condor has all of this knowledge about these back-end systems, about these TerraGrid resources, RENC resources, OSG, UNC Chapel Hill. And it knows how those resources are performing at this very moment. And it knows it runs nightly maintenance jobs, which probes all these systems and say, OK, which, which of you are up and running today? Uh, can I authenticate against you? If I do authenticate, can I find the stuff that I expect to find at this particular, at this particular resource because the engagement team has pre-staged it there? So it does all of this background maintenance work on its own. So you've got this engine that knows about all the potential resources and what their characteristics and capabilities are. And you've got this other piece that's bringing in this huge job load. And then Condor, through the matchmaking system, does its job. It just starts sending the jobs out to all its different places. And we don't even know where a job lands until after it's landed. Uh, for the TerraGrid accounting systems, uh, we have to account for every single job we send to the TerraGrid and be able to tell them exactly who ran that job and where it landed. So we had to implement this little uh, phone home feature so that after a job lands on a resource, it phones home back through a web service interface to tell us where it landed uh, so that we can satisfy our, our TerraGrid accounting uh, requirements. So here's a, a quick little bit of detail about that back-end engine in terms of how it goes about deciding where to send jobs. Um, this, the system starts off, and, and when it's idling, it's a Condor pool with, with zero resources. No jobs in the queue, no resources in the Condor pool. And then as jobs start coming into the Condor pool, whether it's through a web service invocation, a portal, however it comes in, it gets dumped into the Condor pool. Condor says, ah, I've got jobs. I need to start growing. And it starts sending what we call pilot jobs or glidens. Pilots, pilots and glidens are the same thing. It's basically just poking a hole uh, through the scheduler in the target resource. And then once it gets through the queue, once it's made its way through the queue and it begins to execute at that remote resource, it wakes up and says, oh, I, I'm ready. I'm ready to do some work. And it calls back and contacts uh, the Condor master and says, if you've got work, give it to me. And if all the work has already been done because that particular pilot sat in the queue for a very long time because that was a highly utilized resource. There may, there may be no work to do, so it'll just kill itself. And all of this stuff happens you know, basically through implementation on our part. We didn't have to do any software development to make all this happen. This is just implementing existing stuff. And that's one of the very important uh, uh, tenants we have. We do not have a lot of software developers, so we do as little software development as possible and as much integration and leverage of existing packages as possible. So then Condor starts sending these jobs out. And uh, some of the benefits here, so it's provision on demand, and it enables uh, block submits. So, we can, so after you've poked that hole in the remote scheduler, 
uh, now the Condor system can decide how much work to send to it. You know, if it has a thousand jobs sitting around and you know, most of them are anticipated to work for five minutes, then we can chunk it up and send 30, 40 jobs at a time, and we don't have to, again, sit in the queue and wait for that to happen, as long as we don't break, as long as we don't break any policies. And if we do, they'll kick us out. So uh, this is an example of how we were doing some of the tuning on this system, on this Glidin system. And what we see here is these green jobs, this green area are jobs that are running, actually running at a remote resource. This blue line are the pilot jobs. So obviously, you can only have as many jobs running as you have pilots. So here's a case where we've got some pilots out there on remote resources that are waiting for jobs and not executing. So we're burning through our allocation here, and that's not a good thing. We don't want to have that. And we want to track this job load very carefully. So you can see over here, we finally got the, uh, the configuration settings right. And it's literally just a set of configurations. It's not software development. So that as these jobs begin completing, uh, the pilots start killing themselves off as well. And so we need to be able to track that job load very carefully. So we do a lot of site scoring as well. Uh, a lot of, uh, as these jobs flow, and again, this is all high throughput computing concepts, standard stuff that happens out there. Uh, as we push through a bunch of jobs at a site, if there's a site that's churning our jobs through very quickly, we increase its rank. And once we increase its rank, jobs are more likely to match to that site. If a site is failing a bunch of our jobs or all of their jobs, then we decrease the rank on that site and no, more, no future jobs get matched there. And what that causes is, uh, uh, is avoidance of a lot of failures because you're not sending jobs and waiting for that job to return and having to understand what happens if it doesn't, if it doesn't come back. If we send a job out to a remote resource, or I, I say we, if Condor sends a job out to a remote resource and it takes too long, the system automatically just terminates it and sends it somewhere else. So all of this robustness is built into the system. So here's an example of some of the, uh, uh, some of the additional benefits that we bring having these relationships with the cyber infrastructure projects, and that's the issue about policies. I talked earlier about how TerraGrid requires an allocation, OSG does not. Uh, there are lots of other differences in the policies. Uh, for example, uh, when you're submitting jobs out to the TerraGrid, you have to uh, embed these SAML attributes in your certificate that says you know, what is the end user that is actually running these jobs. So we have to go into our portal database and figure out who it was that logged in and is executing these jobs and send that information along with the certificate. And we have to do a similar thing for OSG, uh, but it's just a little bit different. And if we're sending jobs out to that uh, UNC base resource, then we actually have to have an NIH grant number for that particular user or we cannot send that job to the site. And then finally, our policy at RENC is be nice to local users. <laughs> so if, uh, if we're consuming up all the cycles and the guy down the, down the hall can't uh, execute, then he's going to come down and knock on my door, and we don't want to do that. So we're, we come in when it's not being used, and we back off very quickly uh, once, once usage ramps up. So being able to understand the policies in all these different systems and encode it and, and basically buffer users from all of those issues, this is an important service that we provide. So I think I've talked about uh, most of these advantages already. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what we've got here is a policy-driven workload management system to these various cyber infrastructure communities that has a sense of which ones are performing well right this minute and are able to direct jobs uh, to those sites accordingly. And then I mentioned the Blastmaster desktop. Uh, the way that works is uh, it's a Java applet, a Java Swing application uh, launched through Java Web Start. Uh, you, you load up that app, you point it at a directory where the directory contains a bunch of zip files, and inside each zip file are a bunch of sequences, and you set up all of your parameters for the blast search, and you hit go. And then there are, there's a multi-threaded thing that uh, transfers each of the zip files up to Renzi. Uh, Renzi cracks open each of those zip files, and then every one of those entries within the zip file gets loaded into the Condor system. All we do is dump it into the Condor system and it figures it out. It knows it's BLAST, it knows it needs this particular database, uh, and, it, and the system knows which sites have BLAST installed and which uh, sites have those particular databases. And uh, recently we've implemented a system that allows people to BLAST against their own custom databases. All they have to do is post on an FTP or, your, or a HTTP server uh, their database, and we have a weekly maintenance job that comes along and scoops those up and uh, sends them to Renzi. We do the format DB, 
and then we push them out to all the resource sites that, that, that run BLAST so that they can BLAST against their own custom databases uh, on this arbitrarily large set of, uh, set of resources. And here's an example from, uh, from that uh, group that I was telling you about. This was the very first run that we did with them. So there's, uh, there were not too many resources uh, available at the time. We've added a lot more. Um, so uh, Chunlin Wang at the Stanford Genome Technology Center, uh, I mentioned, he had uh, basically a, almost 100,000 blast jobs needed to run. And at the time, our portal glide in factory, which is ba that Condor back end system, uh, we had it configured for two TeraGrid resources, one OSG resource, one RENC resource, and then that NIH resource, UNCCH BAS. And for this particular set of 100,000 jobs, it, uh, on their own systems, it was taking about three months. And this chewed through it in about a week. And uh, this is the distribution of jobs that happened to, get, uh, happened, to happen. So in this case, uh, BASE was at a time of low utilization. So we were able to s sneak in and grab a whole bunch of cycles out of that. And 41% of these total job load was handled there. Uh, TerraGrid Purdue Condor Pool, which was that TerraGrid loosely coupled uh, system and uh, this frenzy resource. And of course, this pie chart will change every time we do a big run, because it all depends on who's busy now and who's free now. So I've got some uh, links here with additional information, uh, if you'd like to look up uh, some more details about the system and how it works. And uh, thank you. Thank you for your time.